Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, February 17th, 2022, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, well, I'd like to get back to what the main subject of this channel is, and that is the research into the stone walls of New England and New York. And New York's not considered New England, but it is still New England as far as I'm concerned, but they want to, they want to differentiate, you know, New England doesn't want to be associated with New York for all this bad reputation and all that kind of stuff, so in any case, the, the majority of the stone walls seem to be in New York, and there's also a, a large number of stone chambers in New York as well, but the New England does want to be associated with New York, but we're talking about the stone walls, and the stone walls recognize no borders, whether it be states or countries or whatever. There's lots of stonework in Canada and other states, including California, where there's these um, very strange stone walls that was brought to my attention by a friend on the Facebook page there, which I never go to, but... Uh, just don't have the time to spend on Facebook now and but I was browsing through there recently and of course we got to get back to the stone walls on this channel and I came across uh, you know a page I go to waking up on Turtle Island Tim McSweeney who's you know considered like an expert in the alternative research into the stone walls which he is you know Tim is a great guy He's been very generous to me, allowing me to post videos on his page there on Facebook, and uh, Matt Adams as well. And, you know, I brought up a number of things about the Stone Walls and research points, and, you know, I am a guy, if you're new to the channel and you subscribe for some other videos, whatever, I am a guy who actually went out into the field to research Stone Walls. He's a playlists on my channel with me, you know, up in the rural uh, Green Mountains in rural upstate Connecticut and in uh, Vermont with Jimmy the Paleo Mountain Man here with the Stonewall Code, what I call the Stonewall Code, and that has everything to do with this video as well. And I have been looking at uh, Tim McSweeney's page there, and he was showing this um, sort of odd construction in the stone walls. This picture of it here, which is a pretty well-known picture. I believe it comes from Rhode Island. If it's not the one from Rhode Island, it's one very much like it. And I had originally wanted to go back to the article I had originally read on the if this, if not this, something very similar to this in Rhode Island through the Rhode Island uh, Historical Society was looking at these stone constructions in Rhode Island there and it came to some sort of conclusion that you know many of these con stone constructions were not done by colonists or settlers they seemed to be native and this section of it here was you know in their opinion was uh, one of the people who were doing the investigating there was their opinion was a, sto a native stone construction, but some farmer or, you know, colonist or settler had incorporated their wall into this, you know, sort of piece of artwork. And, you know, it is very, you know, odd <laughs> construction there, you know, obviously it has all these holes in it and everything, but, you know, niches, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, to me, because of my own research up there in Vermont and at Mallory there up in uh, Sherman, Connecticut, where my youngest sister lives, um, I came across, you know, these parts of the stone walls, which I considered to be art walls. I was calling them art walls a few years back. This article was written in 2018, but I was calling them art walls long before that on my channel, but I not only thought they were art walls, but I believe that some sort of language was, you know, that this just simply wasn't a piece of art. And actually, if it, let's say it is a piece of art, quote unquote, because that's often now they say it of art, quote unquote. Okay, so 
what does art say? What does art do? You know, what is it trying to say? Often art is trying to say something, whatever it may be, you know, to, to say something to the viewer. So what is it trying to say? If anything, is it just art for art's sake? You know, I mean, it seems to be what is being said by even alternative researchers. But I say that it's more than that. I say it's trying to say something, okay? And the reason why I say that is because of my own research into the stone walls. It was just not only the serpent heads incorporated into the stone walls, which is one of the things that I found out about on my channel, was how these serpents were incorporated. And I have, you know, here's a playlist called The Stone Walls of Northeast North America, where I go over that. And that art, you know, it, I mean, it's hard convincing even the people in the alternative community that there's something else going on in these stone walls that's something above and beyond just simply art for art's sake. Now, the wall up on Jimmy's property. You don't need to see this video here. So my internet is very slow today for whatever reasons. But you can see in my playlist here, I go over a number of things about the stone walls here. And look, everybody knows who I am. Anybody in the field of research knows exactly who I am and that I've done this research. I feel I brought a number of things to the attention of some of these people like Tim McSweeney, let's say, waking up on Eternal Island and Facebook there, about the eye in the wall, and that all the walls are representative of the serpent, where they have the effigy head in them, which repeats itself again and again, which I showed on my channel. But not only that, like up in Jimmy's wall there, which he lives on top of a mountain, he owns a piece of property up there on top of a mountain with several stone walls on it, which I show on my channel. I'm up there visiting him, you know, just... Again, if you're new to the channel, you subscribe for some other reason, some other video, other topic. You know, I did go up there to visit Jimmy. After he showed me the wall on his property there, I said, wow, there's something going on. There's just, just not simply a wall. There's some sort of art, and art always says something, okay? I mean, it could be just art for art's sake, some abstract thing that they made but i don't think so okay and as i say i go over it on my channel okay here's a configuration of stone that is repeated again and again in the stone walls okay tim mcsweeney seems to think it's part of the head of the serpent the squib what they call the opening in the sides of the head of the serpent so he seems to think it's that but on you know like the wall that i'm showing here behind this picture that drawing that I drew of the configuration of stones with these stones here sort of flat stones arranged this way you know with some larger stones in the same exact locations often again and again in the walls here this negative space which is the opening but or niche but I liken this sort of stone language to that of the mind because they use a series of lines and dots and things to in their language. And I go over it on my, in these, this video right here. I have a lot of good points to bring up about this. Okay, so I don't believe that this is just art for art's sake. I believe it's saying something. Okay, and so the Rhode Island Historical Society person who was doing this investigation or whatever seemed to think that some settler or colonist found this on their property some farmer and they decided to build the stone wall into it they decided not to tear it down just build the stone wall into this section of wall here and you know because they liked it or whatever it is okay that's their suggestion there and i say that's a bunch of nonsense even though they're willing to recognize it as a piece of native stonework they're not willing to recognize that the rest of the stone wall was probably built by the native peoples who built this as well, okay? And many, many other sections of stone wall everywhere, as this article is going to state. And that's one of the reasons why I want to read it, okay? Because it shows this sort of cracking of the ceiling on this whole topic, okay? So there's other people out there, like the, the author uh, interviewed for this article here for the day, and it's very optimistic, at least on my side of it, although we could talk about it a little bit more because the predominant amount of Stonewall seems to be in New York State. 
and New York State was Iroquoian territory as far as the native peoples are concerned. Okay. But the Iroquois are late comers. So when they talk about archaeology and anthropology done before a certain time, they call it pre Iroquoian. Okay. So the Iroquoian people were late comers to this area. Okay. And from what we know historically, they no, nobody ever they never claimed the stone walls. They weren't necessarily living among them, although it's kind of hard to avoid them in New York State. They're everywhere, but there's not you know there's areas, there's open areas there certainly, which are large open areas which in which to live in for anybody who would decide to go there. Of course, the colonists and settlers chose the prime pieces of property there which were occupied by the native peoples formerly but 95 percent of them had died by the time the settlers and colonists had got there through disease and violence but let's read this article here because it's very optimistic and you know it just shows that you know the tide is changing and i'm sure this aggravates and angers many of the people up there in the New England area and New York and wherever the stone walls are, it makes them very angry that anybody would suggest that the stone walls were built by anybody other than the columns and settlers. But I never say that on my channel. I certainly there was stonework that was done by columns and settlers, some very nice stonework done by settlers and colonists. But all these primitive walls that are up on mountaintops, like Mount Ephraim in Vermont, that go for miles and miles, okay, you're telling me one family did that, a guy and his two kids or something like that were out there building these walls, and it doesn't matter how fast they could build some walls, there's a lot of other work that's got to be done back in colonial times, in settler times, you know, it just can't be building stone walls all the time, because that's what it would require, okay? And God forbid you got your fingers smashed between two stones while you're building this unnecessary stone wall that was only two or three feet high. That's all they are in the majority. There's some high ones here and there, okay? I've shown some on my channel and whatnot, but most of them are only like two or three feet tall. Sometimes only one foot tall. And of course, some of them have been cannibalized. Only the base stones are left, traces of them. But let me read to you this article because it's very positive and very optimistic. The enduring elegance and mystery of stone walls, who built them, and why at the heart of an ongoing debate. And I would say that debate is also a controversy or so. But the ceiling is cracking on this thing. As I said, this article is from 2018. Supporters of Native American wall origins say natives often use large, flat, fractured ledge stones to build walls that were designed as artistic and spiritual expressions, such as this construction in North Stonington, rather than walls built with irregularly shaped field stones Farmers dug out of the ground. Okay, so I show on my channel from a place where my buddy Dennis D, which I haven't been in touch with him in years now, but we were in touch, and he has a channel of his own where he shows this. Uh, well, you know, known as it's a, a federal, federal, um, you know, native um, designated area of these stone constructions there, including uh, effigies of the horned serpent with these flat stones. But these flat stones were available in these areas, okay? Flat stone is difficult to find in places such as I was up there in rural Connecticut there, okay? It's just a different style, okay? And as you travel around from the stone areas and look at the different effigies and the different constructions, you can see this the subtle stylistic changes, okay? The subject matter is the same, but the stylistic changes. And again, from my own research, there's not only this depicted in the stone walls. There's many other arrangements of stone, but including a cross, like a Maltese cross, just clear as day in Jimmy's wall, 
up there on his property. I had photographs of it, but my laptop was stolen while I was traveling, you know, throughout the states there in 2018. It was going across the United States, out out west in New Mexico and all that kind of stuff, looking at all sorts of ancient things. So, I wish I could have done more. Just didn't have the money. But, I'd love to get back up to um, the stone walls. I just, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. And I have a good foundational body of research on the walls. But more needs to be done. And more could be done. And some more fantastic things could be shown. Just amazing things that were done. that show more involvement than what is known. And I say that this section of the wall here is not just simply a random artistic, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, abstract art, artistic expression, but it's trying to say something. That's what it is. It's just, you, we can't read the stone walls. You, obviously, we'd have to learn how to do that. But... As I said, it's some sort of language similar to the Mayans or whatever. You, you know, you just see a jumble of stones here. But if you knew how to arrange them in a way that reflected some sort of pictogram or sort of, you know, art word or whatever it is, it, may, it could say more. And I think it does. And I think that, you know, these areas were show a level of organization that would require different areas to be identified and numbered let's say because how else could you identify them how could you remember well you have a vast territory and how many different tribes like the iroquois for example who occupied these areas later you know how are you going to keep track of everything you know you, everything's committed to memory but if you're building stone walls well Certainly, there could be things in there. I mean, in Jimmy's wall, he found a man coming through the wall. I believe the walls at Jimmy's just tell a whole story. Some sort of story going on in the wall up there about the horned serpent and a man. And it could be just a tale of the horned serpent depicted in the stone walls. But you have to look at it long enough to see it. You can see, though, clear as day, a man coming through the wall. A head, arms, legs. I mean, it's just fantastic, but the art of the stone walls is so subtle or in a way that is, you know, not clearly definable that you just say, okay, so just read this, you know, but you can't. It's just, you would have to learn that. You would have to learn the subtleties of it and figure out. You position these stones in such and such a way, that's all you need to know. When you look at it, you say, oh, this three are vertical and two are horizontal with this negative space. That Well, that means something right there. Okay? Just repeat it again and again, but more to it. There was walls of one down on Jimmy's property, the lower property that I was looking at, that just had a whole bunch of different things similar to that going on in it. It wasn't a squib for a servant. It wasn't an effigy head. It was just a whole thing going on in there. And I would love to go back there and get more photographs and more videos up there. There's just, there's so much more. It just really is. <clears throat> okay, so lace up your hiking boots, grab a trekking pole, and set out on a woodland stroll anywhere in eastern Connecticut or western Rhode Island. Well, I was in western Connecticut. You can see all my videos with the stone walls up there in western Connecticut which, by the way, was occupied by the native peoples there up into the early 1800s. So the stone walls were there already before any of the white men even got there when, you know, the Indian tribe there sold the property to them. So how do you explain that? You know, not settlers and colonists, uh-oh, what now? Okay. And before long... 
you will encounter a stone wall. Sometimes it may be obvious, may seem obvious that the wall had been built by an 18th or 19th century farmer to clear a field, construct a foundation, or to keep domesticated animals in or wild animals out. But what about an isolated winding strand of rock stacked high on a ledge or leading into a swamp? Far from any place anyone would ever build a house, grow crops, or raise animals. Why bother lugging all those boulders up and down hills for no apparent purpose? Yeah, like me and Jimmy found up on Mount Everett, we show you a wall that was on, built on like a sheer drop, like next to a vertical drop. I mean, it's just, I can't, we couldn't even believe how anybody could pull all these giant stones up there to build this wall on this almost vertical drop. And why would you do it? It's on top of a mountain, 1,800 feet up. Okay. Why bother? There's no reason. And I go over that my channel in Mallory when I show a wall. It's like, you, when you look at the walls, you're going to say to yourself, well, why bother, you know, going all the way into this corner or whatever? Just, you build it at the crest there and have the same purpose going on. You know, you didn't have to be so exactly, create all kinds of extra work for yourself to put stones on some sort of incline that would be extremely difficult to do. For what reason are you going to kill yourself for to do that? You know, unless there's some specific other purpose for it that's going on that we don't know about, that the builders of these walls had intended. These questions are at the heart of an ongoing, sometimes contentious debate between those archaeologists slash academics who are rooted in the colonial farmer narrative and amateur historians who believe that Native Americans built these walls and other stone constructors made much earlier for spiritual reasons. Okay, so here's the only problem I have with it, with them calling it. This is very good that they're, you know, they've gone so far as this, okay, but like the Iroquois, they were late comers to this area, late comers, okay. They hadn't been in that area. They come from the Ohio Valley, which is something I go over my channel, okay. The only people in the Ohio Valley prior to pre Iroquoian times in New York State, for example, if they were in the Ohio Valley, that would mean that they would either have had to known the Hopewell and the Adena, or they are the Hopewell, okay? We know they're not Adena because the Adena are not necessarily Homo sapiens, okay? Judging by the skeletal remains, who no mainstream academics are denying. They're not denying that the skeletal remains of these people look exactly like that, okay? What they're going to say is they're slightly more robust because they're going to say, well, you got a guy like Shaq, Keel, and Neil right here, right? He's huge and big like that, and, you know, he looks just like one of these Adina guys. We got one of those guys right here today, uh -huh. okay? The only problem is, is that one discipline doesn't know what the other discipline is talking about. So, when we look into the history of height and growth and the academics who study these things, okay, there is no explanation for people like Shaquille O'Neal. There just isn't. And the um, Frisian people there in North Holland and North Germany, they, well, I read you the article, you know, from the European travel blog that was going, blog that was, you know, blog that was going on there, where... They said that, you know, the Frisians there are not suffering from gigantism. They have no history. Nobody has coined that yet for them. Okay, so their unusual height and everything else is not explained. It isn't explained. See? That's in modern times today. Okay, so now you're trying to explain the Adena people who lived thousands of years ago and why they were so tall. Well, you have no idea about that whoever you are there in academia. And there's so much conjecture on these things. I go over it on my channel. We're going to take a look at that later again, about what is found in New York State over and over and over again. Who were these people before the pre-Iroquoian people who built these walls? Well, they're not the native people as we know them. There's some other peoples. An ancestor, most certainly, of the native peoples who were there in these areas later on. I think everybody, 
including everybody in the rest of the world, has traces of the giant humanoid's DNA in them. Hence, all these different configurations, you know, we have of skeletal anatomy in our, human, you know, present-day human societies, okay? It's, they're all expressions and combinations of all the different humanoids that were around in the past. Many of them with all sorts of weird configurations. Oh, my God. You know, but, you know, mainstream is going to ignore them and see them. Even some of the alternative people are going to ignore them, like the people on Facebook. They don't believe that any sort of large humanoids, you know, built the stone walls or had anything to do with them or even existed at all, despite the fact that the Adena are quite real. Okay, to mainstream academia. They could read it out of any textbook if they want, if they're following along with the rest of the textbook narrative. About native peoples in the Americas. Okay, before the native peoples, wherever they are in the North America here, they always say that there were people there before them. All these people there before them. Well, who were these people there before them? Some distant ancestors of those native? Well, it certainly wasn't the Iroquois. We know that. And it wasn't the Algonquin people either because the Algonquin people stuck to the shoreline because they were seafaring people, okay? Who was inland from them? Well, these giants that they were friendly with. And the same giants, the stone giants, were hostile to the Iroquois because he, the Iroquois wanted to dis, displace them and take their lands. No wonder they were hostile towards the Iroquois. But they weren't hostile towards the Algonquin who lived peaceably side by side with them for centuries because they're older tribes than the Iroquois, the Algonquin tribes. They're very old tribes that go way, way far, far back. You see? So, no such thing as stone giants. Well, they're called the stone giants, obviously, because they worked with stone. They didn't have stone armor. See, this is what, you know, us today are going to have an interpretation of it, and the native, native peoples who didn't really know their own history is just erased. That whole time period is erased from them. So far back in history, well, the story has gone round and round. Okay? The stone giants weren't made of stone. They didn't have stone armor. They built all the stone walls and all the stone constructions. It's real easy to see. Put all the dome in there, which are individual tests of strength, all that stuff. And who would move around large stone with relative ease? Well, some large humanoids certainly would. No sleds, no, you know, contraptions or things or whatever. Just you and some buddies and maybe some rope or something like that. You know, just pull it along, put it where it's got to go. No whole, you know, tribe involved and all this kind of stuff. Just a couple of guys building with stone. These questions are the heart of an ongoing, sometimes contentious debate between those who are, okay, we read this already, about the spiritual reasons, and, you know, there's more reasons to the stone walls and the other constructions than just simply spiritual reasons. Of course, this is always the fallback. Again, this sort of bias reflects some sort of primitive notions about these people again and again, about how primitive they were, and... They're, you know, anybody who is just, you know, all these primitive races from the ancient past are just so involved with their deities and all kind of stuff that everything had to be about them. And, you know, whatever practical things, whatever, just, you know, you know, does every chair made have to be a chair devoted to the supreme deity or whatever it is? You know, just build a chair to sit in, you know, or a stone wall to do something, okay? Just... There's more going on with these stone walls as I go over in my videos on them. Recently, I went on hikes in a region with two passionate advocates of this latter viewpoint, Markham Starr of North Stonington and Carl Sherenson of Ledyard. Starr said that for years he strolled the woods near his home and, quote, always, and always assumed all the walls I saw were built by farmers, unquote. But five years ago, after joining a walk, 
led by Doug Schwartz of Groton, vice president of the New England Antiquities Research Association, for who for nearly three decades has studied stone structure origins. Starr began to notice similar patterns that supported the notion of native spirituality over colonial practicality. And certainly the serpent has everything to do, but all the stone walls are serpents, whether they serve utilitarian purposes or ceremonial purposes. Okay, when you see a standalone effigy, yes, that seems to be strictly ceremonial purposes as far as I'm concerned. It seems to be just like a statue. You build a statue devoted to whatever it is, but stone walls, contiguous stone walls, that have, you know, very defined demarcation points, okay, are not these effigies, but yet the effigy head appears in them over and over again, okay? They're all serpents, okay? They're all this uh, sort of spiritual, but they also serve a utilitarian purpose as well, okay? So this is the point that I try to bring home. They're saying, you know, Native spirituality over colonial practicality. Well, I say it's native spirituality and native practicality. Okay? Can you get that concept? Dual purpose. All right? See, these are the kind of things you got to always see in black and white. This is, see, this is where the people who think they're very deep thinkers are not very deep thinkers. They're just not. They either suffer from some sort of Dunning-Kruger syndrome or something like that. I don't know, but it's very hard to get through the thick skulls of even some brilliant people, okay, that it could be more than one thing. If you understand, this sort of differentiation here is not a good one. It's unnecessary. The wall served practical purposes as well as being a ceremonial representation of their horned serpent god. Okay, you see, can you get that? Is that okay? Or, you know, you're going to say, I'm a dummy and you're smarter than me. I don't think so, okay? I spent thousands of hours researching these walls, just as these fellows have. Okay. All right, so... And I see cans with a piece of quartz on top or laid up in spiritual balance. Yes, a piece of white quartz. The white stone people, as Jimmy and I like to talk about. Found all over the place there in Mallory. Special areas demarcated by white stone. Then, then there were serpent walls, which resemble snakes and evoke visions of the mythic creatures early natives believed traversed between the land of the living and the netherworld. Starr said if he saw only one or two of these distinctive designs, he might have thought it merely a coincidence. But after observing, quote, unquote, the same, the, quote, the same thing over and over and over again, unquote, he realized there had to be a better explanation. Starr, a documentary photographer and author of a dozen books on topics ranging from dairy farms to commercial fishing to building a Greenland kayak, spent the next five years hiking every weekend through the woods of the of southeastern Connecticut and beyond, covering near 900 miles. He photographed some 8,000 constructions and kept voluminous notes. And in 2016, he published his most recent book, Ceremonial Stonework, The Enduring Native American Presence on the Land, which I have to get. Must get that book. And I will. While archaeological evidence shows the first people in New England inhabited the landscape for more than 12,000 years, newly landed colonists from Europe immediately dismissed Native American spiritual practices as pagan rituals to be destroyed or silenced through Christianization. Although disease, war, and other troubles brought to the continent or nearly annihilated the indigenous population, the physical manifestations of Native beliefs wrought in stone were often ignored. Still standing witness to the strength of their spiritual lives, the stone objects they created remain scattered across the New England landscape, he writes. <clears throat> it's not scattered across the New England landscape because when you see the LIDAR images of the stone walls, they're just 
they're right there. They're contiguous. They're everywhere. They're not scattered. They're just, if they are scattered, it's because they've been cannibalized in many areas or totally ripped down and torn apart and whatever and reconfigured by whomever. Okay? So, that's not quite accurate description in my opinion. While tracing with me on trails in North Stonington, Preston, and Griswold, Starr and Jerenson pointed out several examples of what they identified as native constructions. Among them were stone chambers that resembled semi-subterranean stone igloos and serpent walls, quote-unquote, that appear to undulate among the trees, point to water sources or cracks in the earth, and feature distinctive snake-like heads, including split stones, which I show one up there in Connecticut. Perfect snake head, too, with a body that had scales on it built stones that are inserted into the wall to resemble scales. Real clear looking too. And there's many more ones that look even better out there. They weren't built this way by accident, Sherenson said, adding that it's important not only to acknowledge their significance and earlier origins, but also to preserve them. That's where it gets tricky, Brian D. Jones, a Connecticut state archaeologist, later said in a telephone interview. When it comes to preservation, Jones said his office relies on recommendations by the state-mandated Native American Heritage Advisory Council, which includes represent representatives of the Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, and Pawcatuck Eastern Pequot, and other Connecticut tribes. The Pequots had their own Algonquin separate Algonquin related tribe here down on Long Island where I'm at as well were considered Pequot <clears throat> even though King Mongatuxi of the Montauga tribe was an enormous stature and built canals millions of you know ten million dollar canals he did while the council has sought preservation methods measures for burial grounds and additional sacred sites it has yet to suggest such protection be extended to the walls and chambers that saw Sherenson, Schwartz and others had advocated Jones said Jones who assists the Connecticut State Museum of Natural History and Connecticut Archaeological Center staff in planning archaeological exhibits and programs and curate the University of Connecticut's anthropological collections did not dismiss the possibility some of these structures may have native provenance. <clears throat> did you hear that? Robert Thorson and Dr. Ken Fader from the University of Connecticut, the geologist there, and uh, the anthropologist there, Ken Fader. Did you hear that? Jackasses. Okay, cut the bullshit with you're the experts on the stone walls. You're not. You know a little bit about them, but not enough, my friends. Even your own school there has to admit to the possibility it exists. It's more than a possibility, it's a reality. But Jones says he's reluctant to push for protection solely at the suggestion of non-natives, adding, I'm still a little skeptical. It's open to interpretation. No, I'm afraid it's not, sir. Not when you see the preponderance of evidence. Not when you see the evidence on my channel of the serpent head in the stone walls and other artistic works besides like that stone wall there in the stone wall again and again and again for miles in Vermont, on top of mountains where no farming was taking place, okay, and barely any timber harvesting either. Jones also said his office already firmly advocates preserving old walls regardless who built them. We say leave them there and try not to disturb them, he said, absolutely. I don't care who you think built them. Do not touch those walls. 
Schwartz, whose New England Antiquities Research Association promotes the native origin theory, scoffs at what he sees as state intransigence to accept anything other than colonial-centric interpretation. Yep. Archaeologists are so parochial, all their research is based on excavation, he said. Schwartz said, cited written records establishing the existence of native ceremonial walls, including a January 20, 1788 letter from Noah Webster to Reverend Ezra Stiles, then president of Yale College, in which Webster describes old burial mounds. He said Native Americans have a long history of ceremonial and spiritual stonework, not noting that it's particularly prevalent in this region due to the abundance of building material. Eons of tectonic activity along ductile and brittle faults, followed by extensive, extensive glaciation, created an unlimited supply of rocks, as anyone in southern, southeastern Connecticut who has ever st stuck a shovel in the ground realizes, or interplanetary electrical discharge, which destroyed most of North America and sent rock everywhere including tsunamis happening up there in Vermont where whole skeletons of whales are found in the mountains giant tsunami There's more stonework in New London County than just about anywhere else in the East, Schwartz said. The entire Northeast, he noted, has long been an epicenter of stone construction. In 1939, mining engineer um, a mining engineer named Oliver Bowles used U.S. Department of Agricultural Statistics estimated there were more than a quarter million miles of stone walls in the Northeast, mostly in New England. Okay. And again, my most pop, one of my most popular videos on my channel, folks, if you haven't seen it at all, all right, if you're new to the channel and you don't know about the research done on this channel about the stone wall, let's see if we get to it here. The internet's kind of slow. But my most popular video on this has like 7,000, 8,000 views, something like that, debunking the mainstream history on the stone walls, something like 7,000, 8,000 views, something like that, 7,600 views, so it's got quite a few hey guys, views cats about here. those statistics uh, I was just mentioned in the article. Today so it's a real popular one i sort of break it all down because they give a sort of mathematical fiction to the stone walls they say that fifteen thousand men would take 243 years to build all the stone walls in new england and i break it down into realistic time periods into which work could possibly be done okay so when I break it down into those terms, okay, take something like seven or eight hundred years for those 15,000 men to build the stone walls, okay, at normal time periods during normal times of the years. And that's all they would do. They can't farm or do anything else. That's all they would have to do is build stone walls, by the way, in that time period. So realistically, it would take 15,000 men something like 2,000 years. I go over it on my channel. Those are very uh, popular videos on my channel. I break down all the math very well. I think, you know, even the other researchers into the stone walls have seen my video there. It's an extremely popular, well-known video about the walls. Okay. <laughs> For a star, the North Stonington author photographer, that's one more reason to believe farmers weren't the only ones to build such walls. Each colonial farmer would have, to have had to construct four miles of wall a day over a period of 200 years to produce such a vast network. Well, I, I break it down 
far better than that. I'm neither a geologist nor a historian with academic credentials, but as one who has devoted countless hours over the decades building my own stone walls, towers, steps, and trails, I respect both sides' mission to preserve these lithic vestiges. I don't enclose animals or attach spiritual significance to my labors. I simply enjoy using pry bars, levers, fulcrums, cribbing, and chains to move big rocks and create various structures. I'm comforted by the solid feel of stone steps underfoot. A stone cairn framed by evergreens enhances the view of the forest. Well-maintained stone-lined trails are much more inviting than trampled paths. I may be intrigued by the provenance of stone walls, but more important, I see them as a path toward immortality. They endure, and they sure do, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Those stone walls have been here, folks. And not only that, they say something, I swear to God, I'll stake my life on it, I really will, okay, these stone walls say things, okay, they really do, all right, they're telling about these areas, these areas were highly managed, the walls are evidences of it, they weren't there for shits and giggles, they were there for a purpose. Stone walls themselves are walls. They're not simply stone effigies. There are stone effigies. Those are separate from the walls. The walls serve a purpose. Tim McSweeney says they served the fire walls. I'm sure they certainly did. But they also served another purpose. After you burned away all the material, well, what did you use it for? You see? Okay? And the amount of stone walls would show incredibly large populations and what were they doing and how did they have to manage their society well i say it involved the stone walls okay the stone walls were built to accommodate these special purposes okay they weren't just built for shits and giggles to show serpents or whatever it is they are serpents and serpent head is incorporated into the stone walls to show that they represent the serpent ceremonially, but they also serve a utilitarian purpose, you see? So, <clears throat> you can see some of those videos in a playlist on my channel and other videos, Jimmy and I up in Vermont, examining these things, me in rural Connecticut at Mallory, Okay, again, just not a guy sitting behind a computer in a basement watching videos, reading articles and books and things and producing videos. That's all very nice and good. But I am also a guy who went out there into the field and looked at Hi these guys. things close Put up in an area that's seldom ever looked at by anybody. Nobody goes there. You can't get there by public transportation. And when you go there, they don't want you there. Okay, some very um, affluent people live in this area of Connecticut, and they don't want anybody coming there to visit them. They really don't want you to come there and explore the trail there or anything. They want you to stay away from their town. But all the stores there, they have rules in their towns there. You can't even find the stores because they don't look like stores. There's no real big signs or anything. You just got to know that they're there, like an IGA supermarket or whatever and a dry cleaner in a bank. You know, there's no big signs anywhere. Okay. So, I show many amazing things up there. 30 something videos, all sorts of things that are just amazing. So, I am a guy who advocates for this and who were those people? So I'm just saying who were those people who occupied these areas who actually built the stone walls because it certainly wasn't the Iroquois. They're latecomers to the region over there and did not occupy these lands for thousands of years. Okay? It was not them. It was the different people who were there in the past. And how big were those people? Well, I tell you, I did the research on it on my channel here. And this is taken from New York State pamphlet by the head New York State archaeologist. And what did he say? Okay, here, this is extremely interesting. 
Another notable feature of some early and mid middle woodland cultures is the relatively larger size of many of the articles. There are, for example, enormous carved antler combs ranging up to 14 inches in length. Okay? 14 inches in length. Large engraved bone daggers, massive harpoons, and extremely long stone blades, all of which suggest an energetic people imbued with definite and objective ideas. And this baloney statement here were doubtless votive offerings. So they were just, you know, offerings to throw into the graves. They really weren't, you know, to be used by the people because this guy can't make that connection. You see? They're sort of exaggerated, sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, things that they just put in there for, you know, shits and giggles. And very suspect of that. It's interesting. 14 inch combs, guys. Can you imagine 14 inch comb? You need a 14 inch comb to comb, you know, comb your hair. That's pretty big, my friends. All right, so repeatedly oversized artifacts found in these areas of New York State. But no skeletal remains, okay? I go over that. This is the actual research. This is, you know, this is how my channel works here, okay? We go over the actual research and point out these inconsistencies in their research, okay? And how it relates to these other things, okay? And, again, stone giants, yep. We had oversized harpoons. I get it. Harpoons, not uh, spears, right? All right. So there's a lot more to these stone walls and what they mean, what they say, what they are, who the people's there were before the Iroquois got there, who was friends with the Algonquins again. You know, there may have been stone giants to the Iroquois who wanted to displace them and take their lands, okay? Of course, they were hostile. Wouldn't you be? Okay, well, they got along with the Algonquin for century after century and taught them all sorts of things. All sorts of agriculture and about maize and about how to act and how to conduct oneself and all this kind of other stuff, okay? And even the Iroquois get their whole... um law of peace from the quote-unquote big man from their culture's um, historical origins, okay? A, the big man, quote-unquote, all right? Just, I'm just telling you, the big man. I'm just, so immediately to the academics' heads, they just say, oh, well, you know, his personality was big or whatever. It's so full of shit, it's just coming out their fucking ears, you know? They just can't go there, just say, oh, it's just impossible, because, see, they don't want to enable the Bible believers. See, they're dead set against that. They don't like that, okay, because of the whole thing with giants, quote-unquote, which immediately when the word is said brings everybody's mind, the jolly green giant, and all this kind of other stuff, when we're talking about real beings who lived just larger versions of human beings, or possibly different species altogether, which it seems like, okay, and different kind of humanoids that existed in the past, well, it can't be that, and also, that would, you know, that would say that all every historian that ever lived so far has no idea about the actual past, and they can't have that either, because if you pay $100,000 for your education, you better be know what you're talking about. And if anybody says different, well, you've got to go through every length to shut them down, even if they're correct. See, because you can't throw your degree in the garbage, right? That's more important than the truth to you. you got to be selfish about it. Because this stinking piece of crap world makes it that way, see? Not like Star Trek in the future where you all do things, there's no money and seem to, like, everybody seems to eat pretty good and 
sleep in, uh, you know, space age kind of fabric and material. Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind that. Okay. Because I got to break my ass for, you know, 25 cents, you know, dollar three fifty. All right. And it's, it's not a lot of fun. And 90% of jobs are bullshit jobs and suck for everybody. Okay. Even the vice president of whatever companies got to kiss the boss's ass. Doesn't matter if he's making six figure salary. That doesn't upset it. You still got to kiss the boss's ass. He's vice president. Got to kiss ass. You see? Still got to be an ass kisser. Oh, well, Mr. Vice President. Vice President of the Senior Executive Washroom. All right, guys. Well, anyway, I had to read that article because I'm telling you, the one day these academics are going to have to admit that, you know, these things are not what they think they are. And they've been wrong all along. It's very hard for them to admit they're going to bruise their egos and stuff. But eventually you're going to have to see they're sort of, you know, entertaining the possibility, well, you better. Okay, or else people are going to tear them down and rip them up. And we're not going to see what they say. One day they're going to figure out what this language is in a wall, I'm telling you. And they're going to see what they say. But if they keep ripping them down, uh-uh. Okay, so anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that little video about the stone walls. And if you want to see more about stone walls, my channel, you're not into it or just don't understand what it's all about please do watch the videos on my channel okay and hey it's Harry Hubbard on a radio show that Jimmy and I used to do a couple of years back here on WOL up there in Vermont and talked about the stone walls Harry wanted to come on and we got him on there to talk about the enigmatic stone walls and what he had to say about them you know so anyway guys Please do hit the like button if you like the video, and please do subscribe because we talk about the stone walls and how very, very different um, the take is on the stone walls on this channel because I've actually gone out there and done the research. All right. So, anyway, guys, thanks a lot, and uh, Bugcat7 signing out. Peace.